Hello. Thanks everyone for joining the Weave user group. Hopefully everybody can see and hear me. Um, <clears throat> we have a treat today. We have a guest speaker from Amazon, who's Abby Fuller. Uh, see if she can get her camera on. There she is. Good. Can we hear you, Abby? Test, test. Hi, everyone. Hey, great. I can hear you. Um, all right. So hopefully you guys can see the intro slide that we have. Um, so today's talk is on um, microservices best practices for Amazon ECS. Um, if you missed uh, the user group that we did last month with Abby, um, this is sort of a part two of that where it, um, uh, it was sort of broad microservice best practices for Amazon. And since so many of the questions were around ECS, we decided let's do part two and focus a little bit more of a, a deep dive on this. So Abby will be talking for the first half and um, time permitting, hopefully. Um, we have Mike Lang, one of our engineers, will be joining um, later, who will actually talk about the integrations that we did here at Weaveworks uh, with Scope and ECS. So it's a, it'll be a great, great um, hour. Okay, so let's get right into it. So, um, oops, let me advance my slide. If you can see this. So, um, Abby um, will introduce herself a little bit more, but she's a dev advocate over at AWS, and um, Mike is one of our engineers. Uh, if you haven't used Zoom before, this is the platform that we're using to do this broadcast. So, uh, a, co a couple things to know. Uh, it's sometimes best to be out of full screen mode, and to do that, you just hit the escape button. And uh, once you do that, you should be able to see the option for um, the chat window. Uh, so the chat window button is usually on the upper left corner. If you hover or mouse over, you should be able to see a button appear, and that will open the chat window. Uh, now, the important thing about the chat window is that um, it defaults to all panelists uh, in the to field. Uh, I request that everybody change that to uh, to everyone so that when you're messaging, um, everyone can see your quest questions and often uh, everyone can see your answers because we've had lively audiences um, you know, ask questions and answer each other's questions, which is great. It's really like a user group, um, but you have to make sure you use everyone uh, to make sure people can see your great answers. Um, unless you have something, you know, if you do have something really, really private that you do want to share uh, with just one of us or to the panelists, then yes, you can uh, choose that option. So with that, uh, excuse me, sorry, my phone is going. Uh, and with that, uh, I will hand it over to Abby and uh, you can take it away. Oh, hold on. Let me just see. I see one raised hand. Uh, is anybody having issues? Looks like you're okay. All right. Uh, yes, uh, you can go ahead and chat with us if you have any kind of issues hearing or seeing us. Uh, so, Abby, take it away. Um, okay. If you could give the screen over to me. Thank you. Okay, can everyone see a slide that says microservices best practices the ECS way? Tamal? Yep, I can cool. see it. Okay, awesome. So we will get started really quickly. Um, we're going to, a uh, quick agenda of what we're doing today. So we're going to recap episode one in case you guys are just tuning in for the first time today. Uh, we're going to do a really quick lightning ECS overview. Uh, we're going to look a little bit closer at how ECS itself works. Uh, we're going to go over some ECS specific best practices. And then at the end, um, time permitting, we will definitely take Q&A. Um, if we run out of time for your question and you still have something, um, you can reach us on Twitter. Or you can ping the panelists afterwards and, and we'll get to you. Um, so let's jump right into it because we got limited time. Um, so quick and dirty overview of what we covered last week. So what are microservices? Uh, and the definition that we really like to use here is microservices are a service-oriented architecture composed of loosely coupled elements that have bounded context. Um, we used to say that Adrian Cockroft was the best evangelist that didn't work for AWS, and then he works for AWS now, so I can't say that, but still a really great definition. Um, and then what does that mean? Um, so basically, services communicate with each other only over the network. Uh, you can update those services independently, so changing one service doesn't require changing any other service, and they're self-contained. So you can update the code for one service without knowing anything about the internals of the other services. So that's the definition that we're working with. Um, a few general practices that we covered last week, so last time. So number one, rely on the public API, uh, and that 
is the whole communicating over the network thing. Use the right tool for the job. Um, so don't use just one technology just because one service is using it. Use whatever works best for you. And since they're only talking over the public API, it shouldn't matter. Uh, secure your services, that goes without saying, but safety first. Uh, be a mi good microservices citizen. And we covered this in a lot of detail last time, but basically there is a responsibility both on the, on the client side and on the service side. So consume responsibly, respect the limits, uh, document what you're doing. Uh, account for organizational changes. So teams can't work the same way. Amazon uses the concept of two pizza teams, but basically teams should be, be able to be small and flexible and agile and work on all the different pieces so that it's not throwing something over the wall to a different team. So I only work on the back end and then I pass it over to the front end or I pass it over to DevOps or I pass it over to design. You should have small self-contained teams that can do everything for themselves. Um, and then lastly, there's a lot more overhead that goes into microservices, so automation where possible. So understand what you're doing, automate it where, as much, where you can as often as you can. Um, so those are kind of our general ones, so we'll jump into ECS. Um, ECS is Amazon's container service, so highly scalable, high performance container management platform. Uh, eliminates the need to install, operate, and scale your own cluster management infrastructure. So you get easy to run container-based workloads in AWS, you get deep integration with other AWS services, uh, open sourced ECS agent plus blocks, um, communicate with your services via the API. Um, ultimately, the, the whole goal here is to have a managed platform for some of the moving pieces that come with, with running microservices. So, uh, how do we use it? How do we use this more seamlessly with all of our other AWS services? How can we orchestrate all of our containers? And then how can we manage all of this infrastructure that comes when we have a cluster with many different hosts, with many different containers inside of those hosts? Um, so who is using ECS? We have a bunch of them. Actually, the Airtime logo is also me. Um, so before I joined, before I joined Amazon, um, I ran ops for a startup called Airtime, uh, and we were one of the beta users of ECS. So I've been talking about this for for forever. Um, but a bunch of people different using it and many more. Um, this is the question I, I actually added this uh, a couple, maybe a couple weeks ago, because one of the questions that I was getting the most often was kind of surprising. But it was basically, so I've switched to using containers and I've switched to using microservices and I have ECS, but how, how do I compare that back to traditional EC2 workloads? Uh, and the way that we've kind of broken this down is that you have instances, which are standard EC2 boxes. So once you've registered an instance to a cluster, your tasks run here. Uh, the second layer is services, and that's the layer that manages and places tasks. And then finally you have tasks, and that's a container wrapper and configuration around a process that's running on that instance. So there you go, there's really no magic there. Um, all of the ECS pieces map directly back to traditional EC2 workloads, but it's containers as a first class citizen. So we're focusing on the container part and you don't have to worry about the underlying EC2 architecture. Um, so how does EC2, ECS work? So this is obviously a really, a really high level diagram, but you have a load balancer. It's ALB or ELB. ALB is an application load balancer. ELB is a traditional elastic load balancer. Uh, your load balancer routes traffic to your cluster instances, and your cluster is made up of one or more EC2 instances. So each cluster instance runs one or more services. Um, you can go a little bit a little bit deeper. So each cluster instance runs one of the more of the services. A service controls things like the numbers of copies you want running of a task, so that's your desired count, and registers your service with a load balancer. The task definition controls everything else. So container image, environment variables, resource allocation, logger, pretty much, pretty much, pretty much all the other parameters. Um, this is a kind of a high level overview of what everything looks like, but it's, it's all the familiar AWS pieces that you, you see from EC2. So you can register your images to your ECR registry, you have your load balancer, it routes the traffic, and then you, you auto-scale, and we'll cover this a little bit more in detail, but you auto-scale at two levels here now. So one is the cluster level. So if I run out of resources across my cluster, how do I scale that up? But then also on the service level. So part of the cool thing about microservices is that I should be able to scale those services independently. So if I only, if my messaging service gets a lot of traffic, I should be able to scale up just that messaging service and only the messaging service. But maybe my internal admin dashboard doesn't get a lot of traffic. I shouldn't have to scale that service up just because I need more, more resources for my messaging service. Um, we will cover, I guess, a little bit, a, a couple ECS features in greater detail. Um, we're going to cover all of these. Um, 
the first uh, one, hey, Addie, Addie yeah. hey, sorry, I uh, just, just want to jump in a little bit to ask our audience, um, you know, how many people here are actually already using ECS? Because uh, I know you, you kind of went through overview fairly quickly, and um, if you want, if people want to post, um, if, you know, if, if someone's absolutely new or they're coming to this because maybe you're shopping and um, you might be looking for, um, you know, the value prop, Maybe maybe you could um, share kind of big picture, like why why would someone consider ECS over the competition? So not to make make it sound like a commercial thing, but just you know, <laughs> kind of curious if you're really you're coming new to this because I I know you um, you, you raced yeah. through it a little bit. So yeah, so I usually try to skip the the commercial part, and I actually can't see the questions, so um, because I am sharing my whole screen, um, but definitely feel free to stop me and ask questions, or Tamal can stop me. Um, why use ECS? I think from, I can speak from personal experience, I guess here. So why I chose ECS over something else. And uh, for me, it was the, the easy integration with other AWS services. So I was a really small startup and it was just me doing this. And I wanted to be able to use ECS, AWS features that felt really familiar to me. So Route 53 or auto scaling groups or security groups. Um, I wanted to use all of those because for me, I didn't really have the resources to go out and learn something new and port everything else new and then worry about how, how that second product integrated with AWS. I was already using AWS and I wanted to move my existing monolith over kind of as easily as possible with the least amount of resources on my side. Um, so I leaned, I, I leaned really heavily on that. Um, and my big thing with why I went with AWS as a, as a startup was, was shared responsibility. So a lot of you are also probably from really small teams. So I think the same thing applies, right? So I have, I have limited time in the day and I have to be responsible for everything. So I'm responsible for a lot of developers, a lot of teams, a lot of products. Um, so I wanted to be able to kind of use Amazon's resources for things that I couldn't handle myself. Um, so I don't want to have to worry about whether DynamoDB keeps scaling or not. I just want it to happen. I want to be able to throw my data in it and worry about it happening. I want I want AWS to worry about the servers and you know whether DNS works. I don't have, want to have to think about all of that. I want to be able to kind of put my application there, but then focus on running that application and not so much on the on the infrastructure piece of things. So I think that's the the use case was my use case for AWS, but then it was also my use case for ECS. So I want to switch to this microservices based container architecture. What's the way that I can do that in a way that's as seamless as possible, that's an easy transition for the rest of my team, and that I can share enough of the responsibility with AWS that it's easy for me to maintain and scale. Cool. I appreciate it. Yeah, because I'm um, looking at it, it looks like it could be about 50% of the people here are, are coming because they're looking to learn about ECS and how the people are actually using. Um, and I'll, I'll throw a, a question, and, and you don't have to answer it now, but let's just keep it in mind. So a couple were, can we integrate it with AWS developer tools mm -hmm. for CI CD? And how does ECS help with auto scaling uh, DynamoDB? So I don't want to interrupt your, your flow, but if you might be covering these, we could um, um, either you'll cover them in the content and we can return to these at the end. So I can, so I, I think a, a high level point that I think maybe answers part of the first question and that's, it's easy to integrate any AWS thing with any second AWS thing. Um, just in general for, and I think that applies across, across AWS. So it's, it's a pretty seamless transition to use like one of the developer tools. So I think we're talking about the code star products. So like code build, code pipeline, code delivery. Um, it's all, it's all pretty easy. I mean, when you think about it, like if you can use, if you can, if you can use an AWS product with a third party. So if I want to use, I don't know. So we, there was no code build when I was working with ECS as a customer. Um, but it was pretty easy to push my images in from another CI CD system. It's just another step easier to use it from one of the from one of the AWS CodeStar products. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of power there, but then there's also a lot of there's a lot of extensibility also. So like there is there's no there's no lock in that way. You can you use whatever CI CD system works best for you. It's maybe a little bit easier to use an like an AWS native one, but the the, the world is your oyster on this one. You can really use anything. Like and and the cool thing about containers, right, is that you're making a packaged product that can be deployed anywhere. So build it any way you want, ship it any way you want, and those boxes can go anywhere. 
I can run them on a vagrant environment locally. I can run them on a like a traditional EC2 environment. I can run them through ECS. So it's it's all the same, right? You're all you're making the whole out the whole reason for a container for a lot of people is okay, well, I can put this anywhere. I can test it locally, I can test it on a staging environment in one way, I can test it in a production environment a different way. So they're all they're all kind of it's all the same and it's all different. Like you'll get the same product either way. And then the Dynamo DB question, um, ECS doesn't really have anything to do with scaling DynamoDB, um, but like any, like any AWS product, you can you can emit, uh, you can emit events, um, and then you can you can consume those with other services. And in a lot of cases, you might need Lambda as a go-between. But if you need to scale another service in response to an ECS event, you can emit those ECS events in CloudWatch, and then you can consume those. And we'll go into detail about the CloudWatch events. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was a, uh, we can, and we can go back at the end. If people have more general ECS questions, you can either ask the basic ECS question or you can tweet or email us, us later. So we're, we're happy to help. And there's a bunch of, um, I'm a technical evangelist for AWS, but there are also a number of, of ECS developer advocates that do this all day, every day. So they're happy to help too. Cool. Um, yeah, no problem. Um, so unless there are other questions, I think we'll cover a couple ECS features and then we'll look at how ECS works a little bit and then we'll go back to best practices and more questions, if that sounds, sounds cool. Sounds awesome. Okay, cool. Um, so I think we talked like a couple minutes ago about, about like extensibility. Um, so how, how can I build on top of ECS um, to, to, to work with other services? And I think there's another piece to that and that's how can I use, how can I use ECS in the way that's the most kind of the most effective, um, and when I was when I started using this like like a year and a half ago, I feel like one of my biggest things was okay. Well, what happens when I want more control? And I think that that's a theme of what people were asking for from a lot of different places. Is how can I have like it's cool and it works fine, but like how can I get more control over my resources and how I allocate them and how I deploy things? Um, so we have something called task placement. So a task placement strategy is the algorithm that you use to select your instances for task placement or which tasks to terminate. So you also have a constraint, which is a rule that's taken in, into consideration when you place that task. So you use those things together and that helps you allocate and use your cluster resources more effectively. Um, so you can place them by a couple of different, a uh, couple of different attributes. Um, you'll recognize most of these. These are all, pretty common AWS terms. You can place them by AMI or availability zones, so like US East 1A versus 1B. Um, you can go by instance type, distinct instances, or you can do custom tags. So if you, if you tag your cluster instances with custom tags, uh, you can also place tasks based on those. Um, couple different task placement strategies, and these are a little bit, I guess, more a little bit more complicated, but uh, bin packing and that is a fancy way of saying use the resources as effectively as possible and reduce the number of instances in use so it'll base it'll find the instance that has the the least amount of available cpu and memory and it will place your task there so that means previously if you you just you basically place tasks across the cluster and that might mean that you had one instance that was 95 percent full and then two other instances that were all 10 or 15 percent of their resource usage. Uh, now you can do that differently. So you can pack, you can basically, you're basically saying fill this whole instance up before you move to a second one, which is great if you wanna have the least amount of instances possible. Um, you can also spread them. Um, so you spread your tasks based on that specified attribute. Um, and then you, so service tasks are spread based on the tasks. So you can also do random, um, which, is pretty self-explanatory. It just places tasks randomly. Um, this is obviously all constrained um, with with like resource requirements also, right? So this is kind of the order of operations here. Um, so you have your cluster constraints, which is, okay, does this have the resources that I need? So does it have CPU, memory, port? Um, then you get your custom ones. So your location, your AMI, your custom attributes. Um, and then you get your placement strategies on top of that. So does this meet your, your spread or bin pack placement strategy? And then finally place the task itself. Um, so this is something that I think it sounds really simple. Like it sounds like something that would, would have always been there from the beginning. And I think this, like, like a lot of other AWS features, it comes out of 
we everything is built on on the customer roadmap. So developers say, um, and then that's that's what we see coming through in ECS. Um, so I think there's a couple of different ways to use this, right? So you can either you can use your cluster as effectively as possible, or you can go with with a little extra resources if you want some room to play around. Um, and then you can apply, you can distribute your tasks evenly on top of that. Or you could go one step further and do your custom attributes um, and you could get really fancy about how you place these. Um, so we also covered, we kind of jumped into this when we were answering a question a couple of minutes ago, um, but this is, this is an event stream. So you get all the events about ECS and the current state of your tasks running across those container instances, and you can emit those, and then you can consume those with other services. So you could build a custom scheduler, you could monitor cluster state, um, and this is the example that I used a couple minutes ago, but you can handle those state changes by consuming those events with other AWS services, so Lambda. Um, <clears throat> this is basically, I think it's a really quick overview, but this is really powerful. So all those events about like, okay, do I have a new task running? Has this task stopped? Do I have a new cluster in instance that's, that's launching? I can consume all of those, event, those events and I can build my own logic on top of that. Um, so you can really take this as far as you wanna go because those events are there for you to use. Um, this goes back to, we talked about part of our microservices best practices and securing secure your services. Um, a couple different levels of this now. Um, this, uh, one of the newer ones is I am roles for tasks. Um, so I can, uh, I can use those, those, those roles at a task specific level. So if I have a messaging app that should just be, if I have a messaging service that should be able to write to Dynamo, uh, but I have, I don't know, uh, another service that shouldn't be able to write to, Dyna to, to write to Dynamo, I can get that specific. So I can say, okay, well, you can talk to Dynamo and you can't, and you can talk to RDS and you can't, and uh, you, can, you can get that specific, which I think is really cool when you're looking at it from a security perspective, because you should always have the least amount of access possible. So you can only access the specific tasks that you're supposed to, unauthorized containers can't access anyone else's credentials, and then you can audit that through, through CloudTrail. Um, we're getting a little bit more general here, um, but basically one of the, we talked about like why I went with ECS in the first place, but this is a big part of it. Um, we talked about this at the, last, at the last episode too, but deployments, so if you have a monolith, you might not deploy very often, but you're only deploying one thing, and that has its pros and its cons, and it has trade-offs, but ultimately, you should be able to deploy really quickly and you shouldn't have to worry about how you scale and how you deploy. Um, so with ECS, I think this is pretty easy. Um, so you can also extend that through API calls. So you could trigger your deployment based on a commit to a branch on GitHub through your CI tool. So whether that's like a Circle CI or Jenkins or uh, one of the AWS CodeStar tools, um, you can use that to trigger a deployment. Um, and then this is the coolest feature that I say all the time, even though I don't know if anyone else thinks it's as cool as I do. Um, but there's extra protection in there kind of by default. So ECS will only drain connections from the previous task definition if the new task definition passes health checks. So we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but basically if I deploy a task definition and it's not good, it's not gonna pass, ECS will never drain connections and traffic away from that old task definition. So you can eliminate a lot of times when you might have a deployment that wasn't great, you can just eliminate that. ECS won't even let you deploy it, um, which saved my butt more than once. So I like to tell everyone else about it in case they also would like their butts to be saved. Um, flexible scaling, this is kind of the same thing, but scale your service and your cluster up and down based on CloudWatch alarms. Um, and that scaling is built in during the service registration process. Um, and then since the cluster instances are part of an auto scaling group, you can also scale the cluster itself like you would any other auto scaling group. Um, and those are all there by default. They work the same way as any other EC2 auto scaling group. So everything is on CloudWatch alarms. And then if you want even, even more alarms, you can write custom ones. Um, so we mentioned a little bit earlier on a, an ALB versus ELB. And this is, I guess, this is, I guess, more of a more of a PSA, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But ALB is new. Um, highly recommended to go with ALB for ECS rather than e, uh, ELB, so load balancer classic. Um, 
ALB looks really complicated, but basically you're defining routing rules based on content, which is a super fancy way of saying send traffic to different services based on endpoint. And this is magical. And it's so magical that I literally wrote this is magical in the slides. So as a bonus here, this lets, we talked about ports being a resource constraint earlier, and this removes that resource constraint. So what you can use ALB for is you can, you can use it to let ECS allocate ports dynamically rather than statically. So you can have one single ALB, and I, this is important also because I am cheap, and startups are also cheap, but you only need one ALB. If you can route your traffic based on endpoint, and you can, you can remove your port constraint, you can, only use, you can use just that one ALB, and you can handle multiple services with it, where previously, you'd need a different ELB, and it, that single port for every single service, which gets really expensive when you're using microservices and you're going from, from one app or two apps or three apps to 100, 200, 300 services. Uh, you can just do those through one ALB. Um, so this is my pretend fake demo time, um, but we're just gonna look at everything uh, with a little bit more detail with, from what the console looks like, um, just so people get a little bit more familiar. So this is, this is our IAM rules for tasks. Um, and you can basically just see that you can break this role down to, to a really low level. So you can see that it can talk to Dynamo, talk to the message queue. That is it. That is a message service role. And that only message tasks get that role. And that is, that is it. They can't access anything other than that. You're only giving them access, not taking access away. Um, task placement is, I think, a little harder to show. But you can see that for our little demo task, we're spreading it out based on the availability zone. So when I deploy those tasks, we'll distribute them evenly uh, between uh, US East 1A, ECS 1B, uh, US East 1B, and then 1D. Um, but you can spread those all out, which is good because I love high availability. Um, scaling should look really familiar. So uh, earlier you had to do this kind of a funky way through Lambda if you wanted to scale up just a service, but now it's baked in and you need, you need two different pieces. And I think the second piece is often overlooked, but you have to scale up on high resource utilization. So add one task when our CPU usage is greater than 80, 80%. And then I also wanna scale back down because if, I, if my traffic, so for a messaging app, right, we might scale up and down many times a day because uh, people wanna talk more at different points in the day. So I have to scale up to meet that traffic but I don't want to keep all those tasks running around, spending all my money um, when, I don't, when I don't need them. So I have to scale back down again afterwards. Um, this is an example of what I think is so magical. Um, but basically, this is a successful deployment. So I deploy my web task. It registers my two targets in my target group, which is part of that ALB. That's, so that's that slash web endpoint. Um, and then it begins draining those connections. And then you see that my, you see that my deployment was successful. Um, I started draining connections, then I stopped my two old ones, and then it says, okay, so the web has reached a steady state. If this hadn't worked, it would never drain those connections off, and it would never deregister my old ones from the load balancer. Um, so it can, it can save me from a bad deployment. Um, this is a, just one example of event stream. Um, you can get a lot fancier than this, and I didn't actually test this out because I don't want to email myself every time. Um, but you can see that we have, the, we have my event type, which is the state change. So basically anytime, um, anytime I add any, any, any state change in that cluster, I can send an email to, or I'm going to my, my SNS topic but then I can email me because I've subscribed to that topic. So it's really powerful, just a silly example, um, but you can use those events for anything and you can consume those with other services. Um, these are just a couple of ECS specific things basically, but we talked about the agent being open source lately um, a couple minutes ago, and that's something that I think we feel really strongly about right now. So we have blocks and we have uh, we have uh, the ECS agent, but they're both open source. You can contribute to both of them. Um, so if you have something that you want to see in ECS or blocks, um, help us out and let us know. And then the, the roadmap there is, is transparent. It's all on GitHub. Um, so you can, you can check that out yourself. Um, unless there are specific questions from Tamal, um, we can cover really quickly um, some ECS specific best practices. Um, we're going to go really high level first, and then we'll talk about them um, a little bit more in detail. But basically, version control everything. 
So don't just version control your task definition, but link that back to a specific commit. Um, ALB versus ELB, and I totally spoiled that one for myself earlier, but I like ALB. Um, paddle not pets, maximize your cluster resources, and alert, alert, alert. Um, so for this first one, version control is your friend. So I think it's really easy, I think, to kind of mess up Docker tags, um, but version control everything possible. So version control your container images. So here's an example of some that I've used in the past, but if you don't tag a Docker image, it will default to latest, um, which is fine if you wanna use that for like a, like a vagrant image to start up a dev environment, but it's maybe not great in production and it's maybe not great in staging because you wanna be able to test two images. Um, so what I did is I tagged those back to a specific commit so when I built my image through my CI CD system, I tagged that with the SHA of that build. So I could link that back from ECS, both to a task definition revision and then to a build, and then that build back to a commit. So I could go all the way back. So for each task definition that I deployed, I knew about the task revision, I knew about the commit, and I knew about the build, which makes it a lot easier, a lot easier to debug. Um, ALB versus ELB. Um, Highly recommend ALB. Um, if nothing else, the dynamic port mapping um, is awesome. Because previously, if I had a messaging service and I wanted to scale up only my messaging service, I could. But if it was tied to, for example, 8081, um, and I had used four different, if I had four cluster instances, if I had used port 8081 on all of them, I had to, I had to start up a whole new cluster instance. To, to handle my new task definition, even if I had tons of memory and CPU across the cluster. So the, the dynamic port allocation is great, um, uses the resources more efficiently, um, and then part of ALB, um, you get CloudWatch and access logs with, with a little bit more detail. Um, Kettle Not Pets has been kind of, I guess, my, my pet saying for, for a bunch of ECS presentations, but basically cluster servers should be redundant and replaceable. Do not plan on anything sticking around. If you have data that you care about, it does not belong in just a file on your cluster host. Put it somewhere else. Um, if it's important, send it somewhere else. So logs, ship them off somewhere else. Data, ship it, stored in a database, send it somewhere else. But you shouldn't care about your cluster servers. And I hate, and I, I don't like looking at like customer, like someone just being like, okay, well, I'm having problems with ECS. And then you look and the server's been around since like October 2014. Keep your AMIs up to date, keep your service up to date, but make sh automate everything. So make sure that if you, you can kill that server off, it doesn't matter, does it have a problem? Just kill it, replace it with something else. So don't get attached to them, just make sure that every new server that comes up is exactly like the other ones. You start everything automatically and then you can kill it off when you need to. Um, we've covered this I think a couple, in a couple different ways, but you maximize your resources. Don't spend more money or more resources than you need to. So you utilize those task placement policies and really customize them to get the most out of ECS. Um, set sensible resource limits for your services. So uh, ECS will respect your resource limits. So if I say, don't give a task that only needs like, just like a little bit of memory, don't give it a bunch because then ECS won't be able to use that memory for a service that really needs it. Um, and then set scaling policies. So don't let resources scale idle, set idle, which is what we were looking at with those alarms earlier, is that not only do you have to scale up when you need more resources, but scale back down again. If you're not using that resource, get rid of it. Um, and then finally, alert, alert, alert. So part of automation is that like you, something can get really wrong before you know about it if you don't set sensible alerts. Um, take advantage of the built-in AWS tools, so logs, driver, or CloudWatch. Um, let services and clusters scale on events, but add checks. So you don't wanna let your service probably scale until infinity without requiring a human to step in. Um, so maybe just make it so that it alerts you if it's scaled so many times in the last couple of hours or if your cluster size gets above 20 or 50 or whatever makes sense for you. Make sure that every once in a while a human looks at it. Um, and then parse logs and alerts. So this is something that I don't see covered a lot, but if you, have, if, you, if you have a page and you get woken up at three o'clock in the morning and your first response to that page is just to dismiss it and say, oh, that's not an issue, your first response should really be to fix it. If it's, if it's waking you up and if it's not important, don't alert on it or fix the error or catch the error or handle the error better. Um, 
but just make sure that that you parse your logs and you parse your alerts to get rid of all the noise so that when something important really happens, you're right on top of it. Um, that is all I have. Um, happy to cover questions and I can give the floor back to Tamao. Um, I haven't Excellent. seen it. Yes, there are quite a few actually. And, um, <laughs> I saw fact, a little blinking orange light, but <laughs> yeah. If you want to um, uh, hit escape, you can also see the chat window. So um, I'll start with one. So this is going back, but I, I just didn't want to uh, interrupt your flow. So um, one question is: Are task placement strategies supported in cloud formation? Um, I do not know off the top of my head, but my guess would be yes. Um, my guess would be yes, um, but I am not 100% sure. I have not tried to do it yet. Okay. Um, oops, I just posted one first. Oh yeah, will you support, I don't know, will you support to configure an app load, uh, sorry, um, ALB to route traffic to more than one port of tasks of a service? Sorry, I'm having a little trouble reading this. Um, do you support, um, configuration of ALB to route traffic to more than one port? Um, assuming that I understand this question, yeah, which so. I'm not 100% hundred, not sure that I do, um, but assuming I understand it, the, so you can use this the traditional way and you can, you can use a static port. So if I have a my messaging, my messaging app and it uses port 8081, I can still, I can still tie ALB directly to that, to that port. How the dynamic port mapping works is that I'm saying, I basically specify zero as my port, and ALB uses that to just pick a free, to pick a free port. Um, so you have, you have two options. So being able, being able to, to send traffic to more than one, if you're asking whether your app can run on more than one port, um, I'm not sure I follow that question 100%, yeah. but. My, my interpretation of it is that is that yes, you could have different copies of your service of like more than one task of a, of a service running and it can use different ports. But like if you're asking about whether like your app can simultaneously run on more than one port, it's each each copy of that task definition could run on a different port. But like I'm not sure I follow it, but that's okay. that, that would be my, that would be my answer. To okay, uh, yeah, maybe maybe it can be posted again. And just to remind everybody, if you came in later, um, if you do post a question on chat, um, please make sure that you post it to everyone. Um, it, the chat window defaults to all panelists, but it means that um, not everybody can see your question. So make sure you do that. Uh, so an earlier question again was. Um, scale down based on both memory and CPU is not supported by uh, CW and that's quad watch I assume he's, he's, he's trying to confirm if scale down based on both memory and CPU is not supported um, like both of those at the same time I mean I think you can have alarms on both of them now like I could have an alarm on CPU and I could have an alarm on memory so I feel like there's no reason why if I if I can scale up in response to high PP, CPU or high memory usage it makes sense to me that I'd be able to scale down on both of them, um, okay. but not both in one alarm. They okay. have to be separate alarms and then separate alarms to scale back down again. Okay. Uh, another earlier question uh, from Michael. ALB um, supports routing by subdomains? Does it? Um, right now, I believe it's the path based. So I'm not sure that there's going to be an easy way to do this, which is my caveat here. So. I think you probably could, but I think you'd have to do some magic on your side. I think the easiest way to do, to do the target groups, basically, you're using that slash pattern. So slash web, slash API, slash test. Um, I feel like you could probably then route that again to a subdomain, but you'd have to maybe, I'm not sure right now with ALB that you'd be able to get the target group to pass a health check that way. Like it would still have to have a slash pattern, but it sounds like something that you could that you could do with a little extra, a little extra juju on, on your side. Okay. The question from Jeremy is um, for ALB, is there a, a limit 10? I don't know what 10. Um, I think there's a limit on the number of, of target groups right now. Um, it looks like you can have 10 listeners per load balancer, which I think, 
I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a limit there. So you're still going to have to eventually use more than one application load balancer. But I guess the way that I looked at that is that previously I would have had 10 elastic load balancers. So like, even if I'm using one tenth the load balancers as I am before, like still cheaper and it's a still a lot less places that I have to, I have to worry about updating configuration, if that makes sense. So still a limit, but as with any AWS service, we often increase limits. Um, so if that's something, and we base the roadmap based on what the developers are asking for. So if you want to see a higher number of listeners for application load balancers, definitely let us know. So reach out. And when people ask for things, then there's a, a great chance of it happening. Okay. So I think that answers, there are quite a few questions around that. They were all pretty similar. Hopefully that answers that. Um, and then also from Devang, what are the best practices to store secrets in V variables used by a task? Yeah, so a, secrets are one of the things that I think are really, they're really personal for everyone. Um, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, how I would probably do it is, so before it was kind of hard. Um, and there, I think there's a bunch of different tools out there for it. You could use Vault or something like that. Um, what you can also use though is the EC2 um, Systems Manager Parameter Store. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to send a link in the, in the chat to everyone, but there was a really great, there's a really great article um, that one of that one of the product managers for ECS put out um, about a couple of different ways to store, to store secrets with ECS. And I think probably the most effective one is with EC, is with the systems manager parameter store. So you can basically, you can talk to that via KMS um, and then you can get just your secret environments for that. And I will send a link. Um, because uh, I think that that article might help a bunch of people, um, but I'll, I'll send it in a second. Um, but that's how I would do it probably now um, with all the options. Uh, like anything else, there's a ton of other options. You could do it on your CI CD system and you, they could never make it. But what I would go with is the parameter store. Excellent. Um, Alex asks, is it advisable to use ECS for cron jobs? Uh, so, yeah, I would. Um, so what's actually cool now is that you can run, you can, you can run tasks in response to things. So what I think would be really cool is that I could run it in response to a Lambda job. So I can run my Lambda and then when my Lambda finishes, I can run an ECS task in advance. So there's a, there's a run task now and I can schedule tasks. So I can both run that task in response to an event or I can, I can schedule that task. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd use it. So you have a bunch of resources on your cluster. So what I think was, what I think is a cool use for run task is that if I have a bunch of cluster resources and I have to run this task like every day at 3 a.m. or something crazy, why not use those resources? So just schedule that task to run on your ECS cluster, use those resources, and then the task will exit when it's finished. Okay, excellent. Uh, Tanya asks, what's your take on Kubernetes on AWS versus on ECS? Um, so I get this question a lot also. Um, so one, Kubernetes, Kubernetes is not on ECS. So EC, ECS is AWS's kind of managed container management platform. Um, Kubernetes is also a container orchestration tool. So you can run Kubernetes on, on AWS. Um, you're just running it on EC2 instances, which is basically what ECS, so ECS is running, is managing Docker containers for you on EC2 images, uh, EC2 instances, for you and it's just a little bit easier. You can run Kubernetes the same way, but you have to do it yourself. But it uses the same container technology, so Docker, and it uses the same server technology, which is EC2. Um, so yes, definitely can run Kubernetes on AWS. Um, ECS is, an, is another way to run Docker on AWS. It's just the managed way. Excellent. Um, David asks, or David asks, uh, any best practices for task definition cleanup, image cleanup on um, ECR, our yes. CI CD pipeline makes a new task definition and image with every commit. So with ECR, unless they've add, unless we've added something that I don't know about, um, I, you'd have to script something, I think, to clean up an ECR. I know that I had to get my limit for the same reason, had to raise my limit per uh, repository a couple times. Um, so, so the best practices, I think, is that you, you should, I would script something um to do, like to delete 
assert like to run through and like delete images every night if you don't need them because we had the same problem. Um, I think ECS has improved a lot on kind of garbage collecting on the cluster instances themselves um, and cleaning up images in ECR maybe needs a little bit of work, um, but I'd like to see that also. Uh -huh. So definitely, definitely let your account manager know, but I'd, I'd script it for now and then keep pushing for a managed way if that's what you're looking for. Excellent. Um, I'm not sure if you sort of covered this, but Jude asks, is there a workaround to use ALB with domain-based routing instead of path-based routing? We have 100 plus microservices already. How do we migrate easily to update our endpoints? I do not have an answer to that off the top of my head. I'm not sure there is an easy way right now. Um, ALB was designed to do path-based routing because um, you want to drive traffic based on content. Um, I don't know if there's an easy workaround, but I'd be interested to know if that's a common if that's a common use case that we want to migrate over to ALB. Um, I know that when I switched from ELB to ALB, I did not have 100 plus microservices, so we did it. We we wrote a little script, but we did it by ourselves. Okay, awesome. And I see some people answering questions for each other, so that's awesome. Uh, Dimitri reposted this question that was sort of not clear. He's saying, uh, say task A is exposing ports 8080 and 443 to the outside. Can I configure an ALB to route traffic to both of those ports using two different service paths? Um, oh, so this is, this is the, it looks like this is the repost of the yeah. earlier question that I did yeah. not understand. Yeah. Um, Maybe um, I'm not. This is this is kind of a funny question, I think, for me because the way that I would have written this in in the app is that uh, everything is using port eighty from the container level, and then I'm using two different ports from the instance level. So like I, but like ultimately, I'm exposing just one port from my actual container. Um, so I'm still not sure I 100% understand this use case, but 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 yeah, I mean. I feel like you could figure out a way to do this. I'm just, I'm not really sure why you would, but. Um, I think it was a good try. <laughs> good <attempt. laughs> okay, great. Uh, and Judas, what's the best practice to communicate with services across ALBs? So I tend to default for, for stuff like this and for services, service discovery um, to using DNS. So if I'm, if I have like, airtime.com slash search or search.airtime.com or whatever I'm doing, I tend to default to things like that. So I can both discover other services that way or register new tasks to the service that way, but I can also discover new services. And I think that goes back kind of, it's a way of, of looking at our microservices best practices, right? So only communicate over the network and the public API. Um, so yes, use an API endpoint, but I would also probably use DNS for that. Excellent. Um, can we sync containers with elastic file systems? Uh, you can use Elastic File System with uh, with ECS um, if that answers the question. Um, I yeah, I mean, well, I feel like the use case for ECS is that you're you're writing uh, for Elastic File System is that you're you're writing data that you want to be consumed by other services, and in that case, totally totally can use that with ECS. Go wild, um, syncing containers. I would probably sync my containers with ECR so that different places could pull from that same registry. And you can do that through IAM roles and ECS. Um, so assuming I understand your use case, I would use ECR for containers and e uh, EFS. There's so many acronyms, they all have elastic in them. Uh, and, <laughs> and EFS for data. Got it. Um, I think this is the last one, Leonid. Is there a way to schedule a task um, to a particular EC2 instance in an ECS cluster. Yes, um, you can schedule it and you can also use task placement constraints. Okay, and I lied. What is the uh, recommended way to use shared volumes with ECS services? Is it EFS? Uh, currently, I think the only way to do shared volumes is, is, is EFS. Okay. Um, I also though, this goes back to my databases thing, but like if you have data that's important and shared that you want multiple services to, to use, I would still default to putting in a database, which is designed to store data that way. I don't mean that services should necessarily share databases, um, but if you have important data that you're getting from your services, put it in a database. That's always gonna be the, the best and safest place for it. Excellent. Um, 
another question. I guess we, I just do live Q and A every time and I'm going to turn, <laughs> I'm going to turn this into office hours, exactly. um, but you can, you can use whatever AMI you want. You can build a custom one. Um, the ECS optimized AMI, which I saw a couple minutes ago in a question about garbage collecting, which yes, the ECS AMI will garbage collect for you automatically, but there's also, which, uh, an open source Spotify garbage collector called Spotify GCC, which I love and highly recommend. And I don't work for Spotify, but I like it anyway. Um, I recommend that for even better garbage collection. Um, but yeah, for the Ubuntu question, you can use whatever AMI you want, but the ECS optimized AMI will have the, will have the ECS. <coughs> so if you want to use your own AMI, that's totally fine. You just have to make sure that you add the ECS agent to it, or you won't be able to register to your cluster. Just for our recording, the question was, can we use Ubuntu as AMI for a cluster and use auto scaling and other features? Um, okay, with that, I think we will um, move over to Mike Lang, who will actually <laughs> be talking about um, ECS and scope. And um, uh, Abby, if you want to stick around, you can stick around and listen. We've just got a couple minutes left, but if not, um, you'll turn off your video anyway. So thank you so much. Thank you so Thanks much for, for your time. <laughs> okay. Always a pleasure. If you guys have more questions, Tamal can pass out my Twitter handle and you guys can, can tweet me. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. And have great. a great day. Great. <laughs> Thanks. And with that, um, Mike, I think if you just decide to share your screen. Hey. I'm waiting for you to mute. Uh, Otherwise, we'll get echo. Oh, yes, that is true. I will mute it. Okay, there we go. Uh, I'll try to be quick because we don't have much time left. So I'm just going to quickly go over um, uh, Weave Cloud, how to integrate it with your EC2 cluster, uh, and then hopefully, if I can figure out how to share the screen, uh, do a quick demo of um, what looking at ECS through Weave Scope looks like. Uh, the top of your screen should be shared. Okay, well, I'll, we'll find it when we get to it. First of all, I want to talk a bit about how you actually go about doing the integration. So, um, there's a couple of options here. We have our own AMIs that are based on the ECS uh, optimized AMIs. So that is the easiest way to integrate uh, Weave Cloud into your ECS cluster. Um, it's going to do a couple of things on top of what uh, the, the AWS AMIs do. It's going to uh, install WeaveNet, which does the container to container networking. Um, and that will uh, take care of some of the networking issues for you. You won't have to worry about uh, port allocation on the external VMs because every container gets their own IP. Um, in addition, it will also install the Weave Scope probes, um, which are the little agents that run on the individual instances that reports the data um, to us so that we can render uh, what's going on in your cluster. Um, finally, uh, uh, it will put in a small config file which has the uh, credentials to actually be able to push that data. Uh, and we've got an excellent getting started guide that has a script that will go do all those steps and set you up a basic uh, ECS cluster automatically. Uh, you can also go through those steps manually to see a bit more detail what it's doing. Uh, now, if for some reason you don't want to use our AMI, you have your own AMIs you want to use, um, then uh, basically you just need to do exactly everything I just said. WeaveNet is not required. Um, but you need to run the scope probe on every instance somehow. Uh, we have it start on boot using upstart and that works fine. Uh, upstart or I don't remember, um, but using like it, it runs on boot and, um, and you just need to put the config file in the right place so that it gets the, uh, authentication token for Weave Cloud. Um, and so, ah, there we go. Uh, I have a cluster that I shared earlier. That I prepared earlier, sorry. Uh, if I, there we go. Uh, so this is running our, uh, what we call our sock shop demo, which is just a little uh, mock um, retail service application. So uh, what we're looking at here is all of the ECS services in our cluster and the network connections between them. So this cluster is actually, has no users right now. So the only connections we're seeing are the ones that are there persistently, uh, rather than if this were under load, then you'd be able to see that the demo, the uh, like user service connecting to the orders service and the queue service and the cart service, and they're talking amongst themselves. Uh, but here you can see the persistent connections. You can see the queue service is talking to the RabbitMQ service. The RabbitMQ service is talking to itself because that's what RabbitMQ does for uh, esoteric reasons inside the way that it works. Uh, so all of these services are currently mapping to a single task. 
uh, they're only scaled up to one task right now. Uh, but what we can do uh, is, for example, uh, I can take my user service here and let's say I need to scale this up. I can do that right from this console. Uh, I can do that right from this console or is it not working today? Uh, it seems that the demo gods have uh, frowned on me again and uh, the, uh, the buttons I'm looking for aren't appearing. There must be something wrong. Uh, but uh, normally what you can do is you can just press some buttons inside this view and uh, you can scale up and down these services right here from the console. It's not, uh, it's not something I would do as part of maybe, uh, like it's not the perfect way to deploy things in production. I would recommend using something a little bit more dynamic and less manual for your scaling up and down uh, in that case. But it's nice if uh, you just got a little service and you just wanna check that it works with one more instance or something like that. It's just for little tweaks. Um, so now that was the by service and by task view. And what we can also do is view things by container. Uh, so in this case, that's not particularly much more interesting because every task has one container in it. Uh, so it looks more or less like the other two views. Um, but there's some filters down here. And so right now we're looking only at the application containers. We filtered out everything that we consider uh, to be not your application, but as part of the running system. And if we look at system containers for a second, we get a bit more interesting of a view. Uh, so we can see the ECS agent containers that are running on the system and they're talking to uh, ecs.uswest1.amazon.com. Um, we can see the, uh, the scope agents and the weave net agents over here that are all talking amongst themselves. Um, and that's all to do with how scope is working internally. Uh, now what we can even do is break things down process by process. This is a much more busy view, but we can see the, uh, like the, the agent uh, processes are over here and we can see how much memory they're using. And uh, we can see this is the RabbitMQ process or at least there's two RabbitMQ processes. Actually, like I said earlier, they were talking to each other. And uh, so you can really drill down and see what's going on a bit. Um, uh, and we can look at, the CPU usage and the uh, memory usage. This isn't actually showing very well because nothing is using much CPU or memory right now. Like I said, the system is sitting there doing nothing uh, right now, but oh well. Uh, so this is the, the scope view in Weave Cloud. Uh, now there's some other things up here, uh, the deploy and, exp and monitor views. Now these are not ready for ECS yet, but that is coming soon. Um, so monitor is a uh, hosted Prometheus essentially. Uh, and deploy is our uh, CD tool. So it allows you to manage your images, uh, your container images and your services and be able to roll out a container image at the click of a button um, and manage all that and have it uh, happen automatically when a new image is detected and things like that. Uh, now that, that currently is only supporting Kubernetes, but we are currently working on an ECS version of that. Uh, oh, you can also view things by host. Uh, Typically, if you're doing microservices right, this view is not particularly useful because every host is generally talking to every other host as all of your services are talking to each other. Uh, but it can be very good for like looking at CPU or memory uh, views. So that is the uh, main stuff that I wanted to cover. Uh, like I said, it's very quick. Uh, where's the... Do you want to answer a couple questions? Yeah, sure. I can answer some questions. Um, Alex asks, how is the service discovery happening? Uh, so I mentioned those uh, ECS, uh, the scope probes that are running on every machine, uh, every instance. Uh, uh, what they are doing is they are talking to the ECS API. Um, uh, part of the install process is that you, uh, you have to install an IAM role for your instances uh, to allow them to talk to these APIs, and that's covered in the docs. Uh, and this allows our agents to um, talk to ECS and find out about all the services that you're running, about all the tasks that you're running. And then we can look at what's, what containers and processes are on the machine and map those back to those tasks and services and render that view. And Anita's um, been helping out here as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's answered most of those. Anthony asks, can we enable WeaveNet to do encryption? Yes, WeaveNet does support encryption. Um, I don't know if the script that I use to set this particular cluster up does that out of the box or not, um, but certainly it would be a fairly minor change to the AMI to go in and enable encryption uh, between all of the nodes. 
and uh, Deshike had added that, uh, I guess when you're trying to go in to look for your buttons, he said, I think you need to select the containers. So we actually- Oh no, so actually I can show that off. That's a separate thing. I was absolutely- uh, But I can absolutely show that off. I had actually forgotten about that. So thank you, whoever that was. <laughs> um, so I was showing off some controls on the tasks on the ECS services, but there we have other controls. Um, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Oops, thank you. So uh, we have these other controls on these containers and these allow you to do a bunch of things. I'm not going to start or stop these containers because that's probably a bad idea for uh, ECS managed containers. If I stopped it, I think ECS would detect that, that condition and automatically start a new one. Uh, so it wouldn't really matter in the long run, but it's, uh, I'm still not gonna do it right now. Uh, you can look at the container logs, uh, which can be very useful. Uh, I don't think this thing is actually logging anything right now. So, um, uh, most interestingly, I find, is that you can actually get a running shell inside the container. So I'm, this is now, I'm directly SSH'd in to the container and I can take a look at what's running uh, and I can do anything I like in here. Um, now you can disable this if this isn't a security implication you're comfortable with, uh, but I find that it's amazing for debugging. Um, so I, I'll use this like uh, in my dev environment heavily when I'm testing out a thing, I'm going to look at scope to see who's talking to what and then when something looks unusual i'll be able to open this view up and get in there and see what's going on uh so i find this is a really useful thing cool. well thank you so much uh I, we are a minute over time so thanks okay. everyone for joining and uh let me get back to my final slide uh why don't we switch uh microphones again one more mic hopefully people can hear me i'm going to share the screen uh, again, um, if you, I know there's some questions online, so here are links that will come in your email as well. If you haven't joined the user group, uh, we have our user group posted on Meetup, and if you haven't joined Slack, um, there's this uh, site uh, that um, on GitHub where you can invite yourself. So again, thanks everybody for joining, and I uh, look forward to future user group talks where we have many other guest speakers. So thanks for staying with us. We'll see you again. <laughs>